Hi, in this example we're going to talk about equilibrium of a, of a rigid body in two dimensions. Specifically, we're going to be dealing with the case where we have bearing supports. So let's take a look at the example that we're going to solve here today. So what we have is a shaft and the shaft has some pulleys, maybe some gears, and we're given here the forces that are acting on the pulleys and the gears, right? And we also know that the shaft is going to be supported by bearings here, A and B. So this is what I'm using to depict bearings. So again, although a shaft could be spinning, right? As long as it's not translating in the X, in the Y, you're kind of rotating like that, up and down or in and out of the plane, we can still consider it to be in static equilibrium, especially if the shaft is rotating with a constant velocity. So our job for today is going to be to determine the reactions at the journal bearing A and the thrust bearing B over here. Notice again, A and B are bearings, but they have different names. One is journal and one is thrust. And hopefully if you remember from statics, there's a difference between a journal and a thrust bearing. Both of the bearings are going to allow the shaft to rotate freely, right? So they're not restricting the motion in this sense. But uh, the shaft is kind of encasing that, um, I'm sorry, the bearing is encasing that shaft. What the bearings are not going to allow is going to be to move the shaft here up and down, right? And then depending on the type of bearing, journal or thrust, one of those is going to keep the shaft from sliding through the bearing, right? Because the last thing we want is the shaft, you know, rotating and slightly coming off of this and then just everything breaking so there's only one type of bearing that is going to prevent a shaft from sliding the name of the bearing is going to be the thrust bearing so one way i remember this is because when an airplane is about to take off they rip up all the engines to develop the thrust which is going to move it forward right so in an airplane we're kind of used to that word thrust moves it forward in a bearing, a thrust bearing is one that does not allow the shaft to move forward. So it's kind of the opposite. It's keeping it from, from taking up. So the thrust bearing is keeping the shaft from taking up. So the first step to solve this problem is to do a free body diagram. Specifically, we do a free body diagram of the shaft. So I'm gonna do it here below. Let me extend uh, this lines here so that we more or less keep the, the geometry. And this is not drawn to scale, by the way. All right, so let's do a free body diagram of the shaft. So the shaft essentially is like a little beam here, just a line like that. That's the outline of the body. I can or cannot, if I don't want to include the pulleys and the gears in here, because all the forces are up and down, they're gonna be intersecting the shaft. So really, I don't really, need to draw the pulleys attached to the shaft. So all I need to do is just transfer these forces, right? There's an arrow that goes down over here. So I'm just gonna put it like so. This is one kilonewton. From the second one, there is a two kilonewton going up. So two kilonewton. And at the very end over here, arrow pointing up, three kilonewtons. Right, so so far we have the outline of the body, we have applied forces. The next step is going to be to put in the reaction forces. And that's what we're trying to solve over here. So again, the reaction forces are going to be the forces that are uh, developed, right, to counteract the, these applied forces to keep the, uh, in this case, the shaft in equilibrium. Okay, so. The, where the reaction forces are going to be at the supports here, A and B. So the first one they told us that at A, we have a journal bearing. So again, a journal bearing is one that is going to allow uh, the shaft to rotate, but it's not going to prevent the shaft from sliding here. It's not going to do so. So the only thing this bearing can do is prevent the shaft from going up and down. So I'm going to put here a reaction. Um, when you're working with reactions, you can kind of look at the picture and try to predict what uh, the reaction is going to be, like the direction. If you don't want to do that, just go ahead and go to point A and assume a positive reaction. So I'm going to say this here. We have the potential to develop a reaction in the Y. So I'm going to call it AY because it's at point A and it's in the Y direction. 
Um, next, we have this bearing at the B. The bearing at B again is a thrust bearing, right? It's going to keep that shaft from thrusting through that bearing. So what that means is we could have um, a reaction here in the X. So I'm going to call this, sorry, not A, BX, and a reaction in the Y direction. Again, if I don't want to think about it too much, I'm just going to assume up or positive a BY. And then when I do the equations of equilibrium, if I get a positive number for this for this force, this reaction force, it means I assume correctly. If I get a negative value, it means the direction I initially assumed was incorrect and really it points in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's go over the steps real quick. So far we have the free body diagram, right? We have the outline of the body. We have the applied forces in blue. And in pink, I have the reaction forces, the stuff that I'm gonna uh, solve for. Usually what we want to do as well is want to include any geometry, but by putting those lines, I already know the distance between these two is one meter, a meter, a meter, and two meters, right? So we have any needed geometry. Maybe last, just to do a proper free body diagram, I'm going to call this here the x-axis, and then this one here the y-axis. So that when we say some of the forces in the x, some of the forces in the y, we know which direction we're pointing to. So when we're talking about equilibrium of the rigid body, right, there's two things we need to worry. We need to worry about there's being some forces that are going to translate the body. In a 2D problem, they can translate it in two directions, so about the X or the Y. The way we make sure that the body does not translate in the X is that when we sum the forces in the X direction, the sum of those forces must be equal to zero. So any force that points in that direction, we call it positive. To make sure that this body does not tra translate in the y direction, we're gonna sum all the forces in the y direction, make those equal to zero. If something points up, right, it's gonna be positive. The other thing we don't want this body to do is rotate. Uh, again, this being 2D problem, the only rotation we need to worry about is this one like so, so about the z-axis which is pointing outside or out of this board um, is usually what we call to the like a clockwise or counterclockwise moment so we also need to make sure that the sum of the moments equals zero and we'll use our convention here where the counterclockwise moment is a positive moment so let's go ahead and start filling up the equations of equilibrium the first one is the sum of the forces in the x must be equal to zero so we're going to look at this free body diagram, and at least what I like to do usually is sweep from left to right. So I'm going to go and look at any forces that are horizontal. The first one that I see is this BX force. Correct? And I continue sweeping, and there's no other force in the X direction. So the sum of all these forces must be equal to zero. I only have one, which means that one must be equal to zero. And this makes perfect sense because if we look at the original problem, all the forces are up and down. And there's nothing in this free body diagram trying to move the shaft along the X direction. So that's why this reaction force is zero or there's no reaction needed because there's nothing trying to translate that body in the X direction. So now let's look at the Y direction. I'm just going to sweep from left to right. So the first one that we have here is the reaction force, which I assume to be um, positive or pointing up. We'll see if we're right. So, right. so we have AY. And then the next one is one kilonewton. So it's pointing down. So I'm gonna go uh, minus, minus one. And then two kilonewtons pointing up. So that's positive. So plus two. Then we have BY, which we assume positive, so plus BY. And as we continue sweeping, the last one is the three kilonewtons, which points up, so plus three. Those are all the forces that we have. We got one, two, three, four, five that are vertical. One, two, three, four, five. So we're good. The sum of all of these forces must be equal to zero. So now let's look at this equation over here. I got two unknowns and just one equation really. So I can't solve 
for any of these two right now. But the good thing is we're not done yet, right? We've done sum of forces in the x, we've done sum of forces in the y. Next is the sum of the moments equations. And as you remember, um, we can sum moments at any point in this body, and the sum of those moments must be equal to zero. So we're not limited to a single point. Usually the advice um, I like to give is to sum a moment or sum moments about a point through which you have a lot of unknowns passing through, right? So if we look at, at this free body diagram, we got this point A, there's one unknown. At point B, we got two unknowns. I mean, we already saw for Bx, we know it's zero. So we kind of already, that's not an unknown, right? But originally summing moments at this point B over here would have been a very good uh, option over here. Why? Because when you sum moments at point B, both Bx and By cross through that point, they don't have a moment arm, right? So they're not going to generate a moment about this point B. So that's a very good point to sum a moment, this point B. The other good point is point A over here. Why? Because AY passes through this point. So this guy, AY is not going to create a moment. BX, as we extend the line of action, right? If we treat it like a sliding vector, it passes through point A. Right, so BX is also not going to generate a moment. So both A and B are very good points to pick for the sum of the moments. So in this problem, I'm just going to go alphabetical. I'm going to start with point A over here, and I'm going to sum moments at point A. And I make, need to make sure that the sum of the moments at A must be equal to zero. So what do I have at A, right? I'm going to sweep from left to right over here the first force that I have is this one kilonewton, so the force is one. The distance, perpendicular distance, the moment arm from the one kilonewtons is going to be one meter, so one times one, right? So we got the force, we got the distance, the next thing we need to ask is, will the one kilonewton create a positive moment or a negative moment, right? And remember when we're doing this, it's what we're thinking is we have this shaft, but we have it pinned at point A. We forget about this B and that it keeps it also in equilibrium. So ignore that. Just think of it like the only thing we're doing is we're pinning at this point A. There's a force pushing down, right, like this. So it's going to make it rotate clockwise, which is a negative moment. The next force is 2 kilonewtons. The distance to the two kilonewtons is one plus one or two, right? And then we need to have, okay, there's a force and the distance, we need to ask, is that a positive or negative moment, right? So by the right hand rule, I put my fist here at the point of interest. I extend my, my fingers, go meet that force and then curl in the direction. It goes up, meaning this is guy is gonna push it up like this. That is a counterclockwise moment or a positive moment. So this guy is up. Since BY is also pointing up, it's also gonna generate a counterclockwise moment. So this is plus, the force is BY. The distance to BY, we're over here, so it's one plus one plus one or three meters. We also have BX, but remember, if we extend the line of action of BX, it passes through point A, right? So the D for BX is zero, the moment arm is zero, so BX will not generate a moment. The three kilonewton will generate a moment. It's gonna be a positive one, because it's gonna make this guy, the shaft rotate counterclockwise. So plus three, and then the distance, Perpendicular distance from point A to this guy is going to be 1, 2, 3, plus 2, 5 meters. So we have no other forces here that can generate a moment. There is no pre-existing couples. Okay, so we're done. The sum of all of these must be equal to 0. And look at this. Now we have one equation with one unknown. We can quickly solve for By to figure out its value. So what would I do, right, I have by, equals, and then I'm going to move all of this to the other side. So 1, or 
1 times 1 is 1, but remember this is a negative moment, so I'm going to add this to the other side, it's going to become positive, so we have a 1. 2 times 2 is 4, it's positive, to move it to the other side, it's going to become negative, so minus 4. Next, we have 3 times 5, which is 15. This is positive, but I need to subtract it to both sides to move it to the other side, so minus 15, right? And then, remember, by is multiplied by 3, so I'm going to divide by 3, this whole thing by 3, so we can get the value of by. So plus 1, minus 4, it's minus 3, minus 15, that's going to make it a minus 18. At the bottom, we have 3, so we know 3 times 6 is 18, so this by is a minus 6. From this equation, we got that by is minus 6. So what does this mean? Whenever we get a negative number, it means that the direction that we assumed over here is incorrect. Here I assume up because I, I have a negative number. Really, it means that by points in the opposite direction. So I can say by, the reaction by is 6. Remember all the units for these um, forces were in kilonewtons. Right, and the distance were in meters, so this meter is going to cancel with the top, and we're going to have a 6 kilonewtons. Again, this 18 had units of kilonewton times meter, the 3 was in units of meters, so meters cancels, and we have with the kilonewtons. So it's 6 kilonewtons, negative means it's opposite to what I assume on the free body diagram. So here I had said up, but in reality it points down. So we have so far that Vx equals zero, that By is six kilonewtons down. Now, once you solve for this By, right, the next one we need is Ay. You would be very tempted to take this value of six kilonewtons and putting in this equation over here and solving for Ay, because it's very easy to solve for Ay with this expression. I can move all of this to the other side and solve for Ay. Usually I advise not to do that, and the reason is if, if you made a mistake in this equation here, or maybe calculating this number, you mistype something on the calculator and you get a number here. Let's say instead of six, you got 26. Well, you can put 26 in here, move everything to the other side, and you'll get a number for AY, right? But it's gonna be incorrect because any mistakes that you did solving for by over here are going to carry over and then ay right it's also going to be wrong the equation might be right this equation of equilibrium is correct but if the value you're substituting for by is incorrect then you're going to get it wrong for ay so a better approach would be to come up with another equation so that we can solve for ay now usually that approach is going to be summing moments at B, right? What would happen is if I sum moments at B, so look, BX and BY pass through that point, so that's these two are not gonna show up in that equation. The only variables that are gonna show up is AY and these other forces that are given. So by summing moments at point B, I'm gonna have one equation with one unknown AY that is not gonna depend on a previous value for BY and and Vx. So let's sum moments at point B so we can solve for Ay. Some of the moments at point B is going to be equal to zero. We're going to use a convention that counterclockwise is positive. Again, we're summing moments at this point B over here. I'm going to sweep from left to right as usual. So if I'm sweeping from left to right on this free body diagram, the first force that I see is Ay. Ay is a distance of one, two, three meters from point B, right? So I have the force and the distance. Remember, a moment is force times distance. So force and the distance. The next thing I need to worry is what is the sign? So as I come over here at point B, I'm at point B. Now I'm pinning the shaft at point B, right? And I'm gonna see is if the forces are gonna make it spin clockwise or counterclockwise, right? So if I'm at B, this force pushes up, it's gonna spin it like that. 
This over here is a clockwise moment, again with the right hand. I'm at B, I extend my fingers, here is A, so I curl my fingers in the direction of A, right? This is a clockwise or a negative moment. The next force is the one kilonewton. So I'm gonna put here one kilonewton. The distance of the one kilonewton is one, two meters to point B. Right, and then we're gonna check, does the one kilonewton generate a positive or negative moment? So again, we're here at this point B, I'm pinging, I'm pushing down. If this guy's pushed down like this, right, it's gonna make it spin counterclockwise. Look at my hand, fist at point B, go intersect that force, curl in the direction of the force, right? That is a thumbs out, or if this is on a paper, a thumbs, thumbs up, that's a positive moment. Makes sense, right? Because look at these. One's going up, one's going down. If this guy's negative, the next one's got to be positive because it's opposite direction. Now, the two kilonewton force is going to make it spin clockwise, so that's going to be negative. So, two kilonewtons is the force. The distance to point B is just one meter, right? So, we got one, two, three, one, two, three. Bx and By do not generate a moment because they pass through that point B. Again, the moment arm for those forces would be zero. No moment there. But the three kilonewton can generate a moment. Now the force is three. The distance is two meters. So what would be the sign? Well, let's check. Put my hand here, extend my fingers to the three kilonewton, and then point my fingers in the direction of the force. In this case, they point up like that. So this means it's going to rotate that shaft clockwise, I'm sorry, counterclockwise, which is positive. So the sum of all these moments must be equal to zero. Look at the beauty here. I have this one equation with one unknown ay. I can solve for ay very quickly because what I'll do is I'll move all of this to the other side and then divide by a negative three, right? So 1 times 2 is positive 2, but I need to move it to the other side, right? So I'm going to subtract, or it's going to become negative, minus 2. 2 times 1 is a negative 2, move it to the other side, becomes positive 2. And then 3 times 2 is 6, it's positive, but when I move it to the other side, I need to subtract 6 from both sides, becomes negative, right? And then to isolate this a, y, I'm going to divide by a negative 3, both sides of the equation by a negative 3. And this is what we have so far. So negative 2 plus 2, right? These two are going to cancel each other. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And so we have minus 6 divided by a minus 3. So this is going to be a positive 2. What that means is that our ay is 2. 2 kilonewtons. Positive means that the direction I assume on the free body diagram is correct. I had assumed pointing up, so pointing up, again, because it's positive, is a good guess, was a good guess, so AY points up. Like, so I know it was a little bit extra work. Instead of taking BY and solving for AY over here, we did a sum of moments at another point. It looks longer. But there's a benefit to doing this, right? I have a single equation with just one unknown or an equation with a single unknown. I can solve for ay very quickly. And then what's even more beautiful is that, is that I can take these two values and this sum of the forces in the y equation. I can take these values and put them in here and check my work. So what do I mean by that, right? We said that if I sum forces in the y, I got plus a y minus one uh, plus two plus b y uh, plus three equals zero. Let's put the values over here and see if it equals to zero so we can check our work. So look, a y is two kilonewtons and it's two kilonewtons up. We had a summed up, right? So yes, so two kilonewtons up minus one, right? Plus two, I'm following this one. Now, remember this one. We said here plus by because we had assumed by points, points up. 
but vy points down, right? So really that's a negative in the y. So minus six. And then the last one plus three is from this four, so plus three. So we plug all of this in the calculator. Let me get rid of the unit so it doesn't confuse you. And we ask ourselves, does that equal to zero? Two plus two is four plus three is seven. Minus six is one. Minus one is zero. So this equals zero means that our values for by and ay were correct. So this is again the beauty of if you sum moments at different points over here so that you end up with one equation, one unknown from those sum of the moments equation, you can usually go back to the sum of the forces in the y or sum of the forces in the x, put those values in here and double check your work. So I think this is just beautiful as, as engineers, we always wanna make sure that we're doing good work, right? And, and there's a lot of trust placed from society in us. And I think it's beautiful that we can come over here, we can work out a problem and we can check it ourselves, right? With this, using these the equations of equilibrium to make sure that the answers that we're getting are correct. So just to recap what would happened, right? We had a shaft, we had some forces applied. The shaft is supported by a journal bearing at A and a thrust bearing at B. We determine the reactions at A and B. How do we do that? Well, we draw the free body diagram of the shaft. We put the applied forces. We put the unknown or the reaction forces as well as geometry. And then we apply the equations of equilibrium. What are the equations of equilibrium? Some of the forces in the X direction equals zero. Some of the forces in the Y equals zero. And then some of the moments equals zero. Remember, we can sum moments at any point but it is to our advantage to some moments at points where the unknowns crash because they're not gonna show up in those equations and we're gonna have a situation where we have one equation with one unknown. It's usually simpler to do that instead of solving two equations simultaneously. Once you get values, right, for your reactions, you can plug them in in some of the forces in the X or some of the forces in the Y and we can double check our work as best we can. So before you go, I'm just going to say that I'm going to use the same drawing, this problem, but for a machine elements where we're going to solve um, the bearing sizes. So what size we need to specify for these bearings, as well as um, what are the size of the bolts that we need to make sure that this bearing stay in place and, they, and that they don't get, you know, like pulled and broken apart. Um, those are machine elements problems. I know you're taking the statics right now, but if you're curious as to why are we calculating these reaction forces and how we use them later on in your courses? You're more than welcome to watch those videos. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna use the same problem over here to solve for um, the size of the bolts that would be necessary to keep this bearing from um, tearing away uh, from, from the support over here. And that's a machine elements problem. So if you're interested in seeing that, I'm gonna put a link at the end of the video. Again, the very first step is going to be always do the statics. And then with these reaction forces, we're going to do some simple calculations to figure out what the size of the bolts that need to be in this bearings. Um, another thing I'm going to do is based on these reaction forces, um, these are also the forces that are on the bearings. I'm going to link uh, a video as well. I'm going to make a video um, on how do we specify the size of those bearings. Again, those two problems are from machine elements, but the first step is always to do the static. So uh, eventually when I have those videos available, I'll put the links at the end of this video. So if you're curious and you wanna go ahead, like why do we care about the reaction forces? How do we use those numbers? Uh, you'll see those examples applied for a machine elements class. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you picked up on any mistakes, uh, when you were following along this video, please let me and everybody else know in the comments below. Otherwise, we'll see you on the next one.